I am Victoria Britton, and I'm extremely honoured to have been asked by Omar to um, briefly introduce his little talk about his wonderful book, um, which you can see there, and which you'll be able to buy afterwards um, if you want. Um, now, his book is obviously BDS, that's what it's about. But I want to stress one word in what's in the title. I like the way that he's called it, the global struggle for Palestinian rights. And the question of rights, I think it kind of often gets forgotten when you're talking about Palestinians. Um, and this, the book has been, um, has got endorsements from all sorts of very eminent and wonderful people, such as um, Desmond Tutu, um, and our own dear Ken Loach. And it's the particular words that Ken has used that I want to emphasize tonight. What he said was a very simple thing, which is, when powerful governments will not act, ordinary people must take the lead. And I think that's who we are. Um, sorry if there's anybody here who is more eminent than that. <laughs> um, um, but anyway, I think that, that, that is um, who Omar is aiming the book at, and I think that is what this the evening together is about. So I'm just going to give you a very little tiny bit of background before Omar speaks. Um, and I haven't discussed this with him, so um, he may or may not completely agree with the way I'm going to do it. Um, but I, I date this book and the whole campaign um, back to 2004, when the ICJ made its ruling that the wall was illegal. Because it was just a year later that you had 171 Palestinian civil society groups that issued their call for BDS. Um, and they, I think it's worth just reminding us what were the three bits of their plank. The first was to end the occupation and dismantle the wall. The second was the rights of Arab Palestinian citizens of Israel to complete equality. And the third was respecting the rights of refugees to return under UN Resolution 194. And I think that kind of bottom line emphasis on rights is where this whole thing has managed to get the immense echo and traction it's got around the world. Um, it was only three years later, in 2008, that what had been the BDS campaign kind of formalised itself into the BNC, which is a coalition. And that coalition had, again, three strands to it. One was refugees, the second was people from the West Bank and Gaza, and the third was Palestinians living inside Israel. And I think that in such a short time, that's five years from when, um, when the, the first BDS call came, um, there's been a complete sea change in attitudes to Israel around the world. And I think this campaign is a significant factor within that sea change. And I would describe that sea change as an ending of what was a kind of lazy, automatic feeling that Israel was a democratic state in the middle of the Middle East and it was seeking peace. And that, I think, has been completely ripped up in this five years. And I think the campaign by Palestinians, both from inside and Palestinians in the diaspora, has been such a huge factor in that. Now, I just want to read very briefly three things to you um, which, are, which are in the book, um, but I think need to be very much kind of um, underlined. The first is um, apropos of Gaza after the terrible events of December and January 2008-2009. I want to take you back to the 1948 UN Convention 
on the prevention and punishment of the crime of genocide, Article 2. The term is again defined in three ways. Any of the following acts committed with intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethnical, racial or religious group. As such, one, killing members of the group. Two, causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group. And three, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part. And I'm just going to read a line from the former uh, Commissioner General of UNRWA, Karen Abu Zaid, apropos of Gaza. She used these words, which I think fit into that 1948 um, definition. Gaza is on the threshold of becoming the first territory to be intentionally reduced to a state of abject destitution, with the knowledge, acquiescence, and some would say encouragement of the international community. Very strong stuff from a UN official, and absolutely and completely accurate, as any of you who've been in Gaza will know. And the final words I want to, to, to read, which lay on from, come on from that, are from John Dugard, who, as you all know, is a South African um, international law expert and was formerly the UN Special Rapporteur for Human Rights. And in 2007, he wrote this. The West cannot expect the rest of the world to take issues it regards as important seriously if it persists in its present attitude to the Israeli occupation. For the rest of the world, the issue of Palestine has become the litmus test for human rights. If the West fails to show concern for human rights in the OPT, the rest of the world will conclude that human rights are a tool employed by the West against regimes it dislikes and not an objective and universal instrument for the measurement of the treatment of people throughout the world. And I think that responding to that, the BDS campaign has brought us to, to watch a new stage of what you might call decades of evolving Palestinian resistance, which has taken so many forms. And this is the new form. As you all know, BDS campaign in this country has had a terrific impact already. But I just want to highlight that the place that has become, aside from the Palestinians and along with the Palestinians, the leader of this campaign in the world is, of course, South Africa. And the actions that individual South Africans have taken and the actions that organizations like the unions in South Africa have taken I think have been completely crucial to the kind of groundswell that we've seen. And thinking of how South Africans feel about this issue, I think is a great wake up call to all the rest of us and an immensely important and wonderful alliance for Palestinians like Omar. So over to you. Thanks a lot, uh, Victoria. This was wonderful. Um, this is my first book launch, so I'm not used to it. <laughs> uh, but I'm glad Victoria talked about the movement, not about me, because this book is about the movement. It's not about me. It's not a memoir of someone who used to do something or has a, had a love story that he or she likes to write about. It's about a live movement that's breathing and growing, actually growing quite fast lately, all over the world. So the movement takes credit for the book, for the ideas that I humbly tried to put together, to take stock of the main arguments, the ethical issues involved, the main rights, the main counter arguments. You'll see a lot of debate, self-debate, if you will. We've had a lot of problem finding debate partners, by the way, on BDS, in the UK, 
in the US, we've been literally begging any of the anti-BDS voices in academia and politics to step up and, and debate publicly. And the great majority would refuse. So we have to do it ourselves, debate ourselves. So you'll find almost all the arguments against boycott in the book and refutation. Since they won't do it, we will do it. Um, I think the BDS movement has grown precisely because it's a rights-based approach. It's based on human rights and international law, and it rejects all forms of racism, including anti-Semitism, which is very important to mention in the Western context, obviously. Um, the fact that Palestinians have resorted to ask the international community, civil society rather than states and governments, to act as they have done during the South Africa anti-apartheid struggle, to stand up and shoulder the responsibility to end Israel's three-tiered system of oppression was the most effective thing we could have done after seeing the failure of the international community to stand up the states, the UN, to stand up to, um, uh, to, to hold Israel accountable and to bring justice, to bring us our rights. So we could not really rely on governments and we had to uh, go to civil society directly as our South African comrades had done before us. <clears throat> the book talks about many experiences of boycott, many arguments, as I said, not just in the products boycott that many are used to, but the academic boycott, the cultural boycott. It explains how these boycotts are institutional. They don't target individuals, and that's an important distinction uh, to make. This is not against free speech. This does not end the possibility of dialogue, if anything. It enhances free speech and dialogue. It calls for debate, and it is a form of debate and of engagement, but it's also a form of accountability. States that commit war crimes and persistent violations of international law should be held accountable. And we are asking for Israel to be held accountable like any other state that commits similar crimes, not above and not below that standard. We're asking for Israel to be treated like everyone else. It's Western governments that have singled out Israel, giving it utter impunity and not holding it accountable to anyone, while giving it very generous support, financial, academic, cultural, scientific, you name it, and it's mostly your tax money that's paying for that. So boycott, divestment, and sanctions is firstly about ending complicity, and that's not something heroic that we're asking you to do. Don't participate in crime. That's common human decency, I think. Basic ethical principle. Don't allow your tax money to be used in Israeli apartheid, occupation, and settler colonialism. That's the first level. And then if you feel like it, we would like you to help us more stand in solidarity with us, effective, morally consistent solidarity, by joining campaigns to work at Israeli institutions, Israeli companies, international companies that are profiting from Israel's occupation and apartheid, and to stand up for our rights. I'll just end with uh, a short wish it's not Christmas yet, but I, want, I wish you something, so I'll, I'll go straight to it. I grew up in Egypt. I lived there for 11 years, but, and nothing had prepared me for what I saw on February 11, when Mubarak finally fell. So I was extremely inspired. I was always the optimistic type, but I've never been as optimistic as I am now that we shall overcome. So, I wish you Egypt. <laughs> I wish you empowerment to resist, to fight for social and economic justice, to win your freedom and equal rights. I wish you the will and skill to break out of your carefully concealed prison walls. In our part of the world, prison walls and thick, inviolable doors are all too overt, obvious, overbearing, choking, and this is why we remain restive rebellious, agitated, and always in preparation for one day of freedom when we gather enough people power to cross all hitherto categoric red lines and to break through the thick, ugly, cold walls that have surrounded us for all our lives, 
like the smell of a rotting corpse in our claustrophobic prison cell. But your prison cells have virtual walls, hidden well, lest they evoke a will to resist. There's no door to your prison cell. You can roam about freely, never recognizing the much larger prison you're still confined to. I wish you Egypt, so you can decolonize your minds, for only then can you imagine real freedom, real social justice, real equal rights, and real dignity. I wish you Egypt, so you can tear up the paper with the multiple choice question, what do you want? For all the answers you are given are dead wrong, and your only choice then seems to be between evil and the lesser one. I wish you Egypt so you can, like the Tunisians, the Egyptians, the Libyans, the Bahrainis, and certainly the Palestinians, shout no. We do not want to select the least wrong answer. We want another alternative that is not on your list. Given the choice between slavery and death, we opt for freedom and dignified life. No slavery and no death. I wish you Egypt so that you can collectively, democratically and wisely rebuild your society, develop a constitution. It's about time. Reset the rules to serve the people to end racism and discrimination of all sorts, to safeguard the environment, to cut wars and war crimes, not jobs and social services, to invest in healthcare and education, not in fossil fuels and manufacturing weapons of death, to overthrow the authoritarian, tyrannical rule of multinationals, to end complicity in Israel's occupation, colonialism and apartheid by adopting BDS, to get the hell out of Afghanistan and stop the genocidal war. To fulfill this country's legal and moral obligation to help rebuild the economies of your devastated former colonies. So that young men can find their own homelands livable and lovable again. Instead of risking death on the high seas to reach your shores, giving up loved ones and the place they once called home. Our oppression and yours are deeply interconnected, intertwined, you see. Our joint struggle for universal rights and dignified living is not just a noble and compelling slogan that we gratify ourselves by raising. Our common struggle for true emancipation and self-determination is an idea whose time has vociferously arrived. After Egypt, it is our time. It's time for Palestinian freedom and self-determination. And it's time for the peoples of the earth to reassert our common humanity and reclaim our common destiny. Thank you. See, I, I didn't say that actually the point about Omar is he's an artist but he's revealed himself to you as that. Um, now, he'll take questions for about um, 20 minutes. So if I could see a show of hands, um, and I'll take them in a group of two or three. And we have a roving mic, so... I'm just trying to get a kind of feel for... Wonderful. And I, I very much look forward to this book, and I think it will be an enormous asset for our work in the United States. I want to ask you about what the PA's role is. I know they have recently um, become involved in a limited kind of embrace of BDS um, within. Uh, I think the products from the settlements they are saying should be banned. Could you talk more about what kind of support civil society is getting from official Palestinian leadership? Uh, BTS is a purely civil society campaign supported by almost the entire Palestinian civil society, and that includes Palestinians in the occupied territories, inside Israel, as well as in exile. So groups representing the great majority of Palestinian civil society are in the BDS National Committee, the leadership of this campaign. Um, we had no connection 
with the Palestinian Authority, actually. We were quite critical of the Palestinian Authority, obviously. The Palestinian Authority, due to this increasing support for boycott, has supported a select uh, kind of boycott, selective kind of boycott, against products of Israeli colonial settlements. And we saw this as a step in the right direction, a bit late, but it's okay. Any step helps. Uh, and I think it's popularizing boycott among Palestinians in the occupied territories, in the West Bank, East Jerusalem, and Gaza. So that's helping in a way. Now there is some communication with the official boycott campaign, uh, trying to push things forward. One thing the Palestinian Authority boycott campaign and the BDS campaign agree on, we both agree on, is the idea of banning settlement products in countries like Britain. Settlement products should not just lose the tariff reductions that Israeli products get. They should not be allowed to enter European markets because they're contraband. They're illegal products. Your government recognizes, even the US government used to recognize before the veto, that settlements, colonial settlements, are illegal. So their products should be naturally illegal. So we're pushing things forward in kind of a coordination with them. But we would like them to, see, to go much further. Do you um, not only deal with techniques for opposition, for techniques for dealing with the denial of human rights, do you go further to outline political options available and how to move from the techniques of opposition into the formulation of potential? Very good question. Uh, actually, in the BDS movement, we do not take a political question. Okay, the question was, do we go beyond the boycott and the, the principles to, to adopt a particular political position, a political solution, or a political vision, if I understand you correctly? We don't, in fact. Uh, the point is, there's a Palestinian consensus on the three basic rights we mentioned. Ending the occupation of 67, ending racial discrimination in Israel, or a, which is a form of apartheid, and I can explain that later, and enabling the right of return for refugees according to UN Resolution 194. That very, very few Palestinians disagree with. That's why we have a, pretty much a consensus on BDS. When it gets to political solutions, we disagree. Uh, some of us support one state, some of us support two states. There isn't agreement on this, so we keep that out. What we focus on is, regardless of what solution or what outcome there is, it must accommodate our basic rights. Human rights, international law, should not be negotiable. We should get that regardless. So even, theoretically, in a two-state solution, that doesn't mean Israel can get away with being an apartheid state. It has to be a true democracy for all its citizens. Refugees should be allowed to return regardless, in a two-state solution or one-state solution. Now, whether that's feasible or not is a political question, but at the moral and legal level, that our rights should be accommodated regardless. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Hi. Um, I just wanted to ask, as Victoria said in 2005, the call was made for BDS. And in the five years since then, how do you measure its success? And is that success coming as, as fast as you want it to? Or is it, you know, do you feel it's just it's calling the law? Or is it, you know? Okay. The success has been well, well beyond our dreams, in fact. It went beyond anything we had imagined. When we issued the call on July 9th, 2005, we had no idea it will spread so virally in five years, literally. Because the most important experience that has affected us and that we're inspired by is the South African anti-apartheid movement. And people forget that, people have a short memory. They say, oh, but that was a consensus. I mean, everyone in Britain was boycotting. Yeah, that was in 89. But they started the boycott in 59. It took 30 years to reach that stage of mass support for boycott of apartheid South Africa. And of course, your prime minister was the very la last on earth <laughs> with Reagan, her buddy. The very last on earth to support the boycott. So boycotts take a long time to kick in, to have impact. We had no idea in five years we would achieve almost as much as our South African comrades had achieved in 20 years. The most important indicators of that, you'll see it all in the book, 
but uh, trade unions, for example. At the trade union level, we had our biggest successes. The trade, U trade union Congress here in Britain, TUC, representing almost 7 million workers, has come out in support of boycott of companies that are profiting from Israel's occupation. Um, many trade union federations, COSADO of South Africa, of course, was the first and the most uh, principled supporter of the boycott in Canada, even in the US, France, Belgium, Italy. In so many countries, boycott has spread. Now it's finally spreading to South Asia. We had a regional BDS conference in India in October of last year to address BDS campaigns in South Asia. Soon enough, we'll have one in Latin America. So it's spreading beyond the West. But clearly, the West remains the main battleground, so to speak, because that's where Israel derives its power, financially, academically, economically, and so on. So success at every level. Cultural boycott has really taken off after the Israeli massacre in Gaza, end of 2008-2009, but particularly after the flotilla attack. We, we, we had no idea people like Meg Ryan, or the Pixies, or Costello, or Gil Scott Heron, or Pete Seeger, or, and so on, or Roger Waters, would come out and support the boycott, but they have. Not to mention Judith Butler, Naomi Klein, uh, John Berger, Ken Loach, and so on. So the, the number of artists, writers, intellectuals, um, best-selling authors that are heeding our boycott call, has mushroomed after the flotilla. So some people can say, oh, but this is symbolic. It has no impact on the Israeli economy. And that's where you should be targeting. Yeah, boycotts don't work that fast. I mean, in five years, we can't imagine that we could harm Israel's economy enough to push for political change. That would be too idealistic. Israel is a very strong economy, obviously, totally integrated into the Western and global economy which means that it will take a bit longer. But that integration, believe it or not, makes it much more vulnerable. Israel does not sell minerals to the world that they cannot live without, like South Africa did. Israel is totally integrated. It sells high-tech, it sells fruits, it sells uh, weapons, it sells diamonds. Diamonds are an interesting story. I have to stop at that. They get the diamonds from Africa, polish them in India, and sell them, and make all the profits. So that's easy. It should be easy to end that revenue from reaching Israel and funding its war economy. So I think successes have been much way beyond our imagination. Thanks, Omar, for uh, um, an excellent uh, presentation as usual. And um, two historical particularities and a question. One of them is the uh, sweet irony that in the country that uh, have planted the problem in the Middle East, and I'm not talking about 1916 and Balfour, but even in the 19th century, uh, Christian Zionism, even before uh, political Zionism, is starting uh, to create a problem in Palestine. So this is the country where it started in Europe. And now the strongest boycott movement is in Britain. I find this very interesting. The second irony is that, of course, the Arab Intifada now um, um, happening everywhere in the Middle East um, is uh, influenced, of course, by the first Palestinian Intifada, which was an unarmed struggle of the civic society against um, a, an army of occupation. And many of them have said that. So this is where my question comes. Uh, I wonder if you could speak about how this Arab Intifada is going to affect, and in what ways, uh, what happens in Palestine in the next uh, few years, I suppose, rather than months. Okay, I think the Arab people's revolutions uh, have denied Israel its Arab depth, literally. Many of these Arab governments were Israel's best friends in the region, not just at an economic level, at a political level, more importantly. The complicity of Mubarak, it must be one of the main factors that has sustained Israel's occupation for so long and Israel's uh, impunity in committing war crimes for so long. Of course, there are other regimes that are responsible, Western regimes, obviously, but in the Arab region, 
the loss of this, the loss of Mubarak is enormous for Israel, and they're not hiding it. They're hysterical, <laughs> totally hysterical about losing Mubarak. Up to the very last minute, uh, Israel's foreign minister, Lieberman, um, launched a massive diplomatic campaign to influence Western governments not to dump Mubarak, to protect him, to save him. To the last minute, Israel was trying to save Mubarak. Ben Ali, many people don't know about that, but Israel's support for Ben Ali's repressive regime, especially in high-tech repression, eavesdropping equipment and all kinds of very scary intelligence stuff, it's very well documented how Israel has cooperated with the Tunisian dictatorship and so on and so forth. So at, at one level, Israel has lost very good friends in the region. This will radicalize the Arab region almost in a very short period. We'll see that happening, mainly because democracy means that people will express themselves. And Arab peoples have not changed much their opinion about Israel. <laughs> they still view Israel as an occupation, a settler colonial state, as well as an apartheid. So once they have the, the ability and the right to express themselves, we will see the support from the Arab depth coming back to the Palestinian uh, struggle for self-determination. So we are very inspired uh, by that. And in fact, we could not even dream of exercising our right to self-determination without massive transformation in the Arab world. And we've always been arguing that. It cannot happen independently without having that counterbalance to Israel's massive power. We cannot do it alone. <coughs> yeah, my question is pretty much related to that. Um, you could talk about um, the boycott in, in the Arab world and how it's, uh, the context is different within the Arab world, boycotting Israel from boycotting the West, and sort of the prospects for it um, if and when Egyptians and Tunisians succeed in forming democracies. So. Yes, it is very different. Uh, the Arab boycott of Israel is very different than the Western boycott. Um, first of all, Palestinians are considered part of this Arab region. So it's, uh, it's not like asking foreign governments or foreign societies to stand in solidarity with us. We're part of the same group of humans that are connected historically, language, uh, and, and so on and so forth. Um, in the Arab world, the boycott of Israel is, at the grassroots level, massive. Still, even in countries like Egypt that have had a peace treaty with Israel since 79, the boycott is across the board. Those that have normal or normalizing relations with Israel are a very, very, very tiny elite. The great majority of, of the people do not have relations with Israel, and they view that almost as uh, betraying the Palestinians, which it is. Um, I think we'll see even more of that. The only problem is the governments did not reflect what the people wanted. The governments continued having relations with Israel uh, clandestinely or openly. The most important aspect in, in spreading BDS in the Arab world is not directly against Israeli companies, because there are very few. There are, but very few. It's not the most significant issue. It's against companies profiting from Israel's occupation and apartheid. Companies like Veolia, the French uh, conglomerate, uh, who lost, Veolia lost many contrast in this country because of its illegal Jerusalem light rail project in East Jerusalem connecting in Jerusalem, connecting illegal colonies with the city of Jerusalem. So we only lost billions and billions of dollars worth of contracts. We want to push that in the Arab world as well. In Saudi Arabia, in Morocco, in Bahrain, in, in uh, United Arab Emirates, Veolia is still winning contracts. So we're, we're shaming them, we're shaming Arab governments and saying, be at least as good as the Brits, at the very least. <laughs> I, th I think there was some at the back. Um, there were two, just uh, three, in fact, together. Hi. Um, one of the main criticisms... Can you use to put the mic up? Please? One of the main criticisms of the CDS campaign is that it's um, unrealistic or ineffective. And to take divestment in particular, I mean, as you know, Israel's economy is, is very strong, it's, it's solid, it's 
triple, triple A rated by all the um, key rating agencies, and its debt is guaranteed by the United States government. So its position is, is very much solid, and to me it seems that unless we can do something so that you, the USA withdraws its economic support, then it's going to be very difficult to have a toppling effect. I mean, it's one thing to say it will take time, but how do you propose that the campaign go about putting enough effective pressure on the United States to withdraw that support? Okay, I wouldn't talk about putting pressure on the US alone and forgetting Israel. I mean, that's in a way escaping the duty of boycotting Israel first and foremost. Israel is the direct oppressor. Yes, it is sponsored by the US, definitely the US is a partner in crime, the US government, and that should be challenged as well, and we're challenging that. Palestine solidarity campaigns all over the United States, faith-based groups, Jewish groups, uh, uh, trade union groups, women's groups, student groups, everywhere, are doing exactly what you're talking about. Uh, I was involved in the anti-apartheid, South African anti-apartheid movement at Columbia University where I went to school. <laughs> And um, I, I said this and I'll say it again. I used to hold up signs, abolish apartheid. And then, you know, somebody asked me, do you really believe this will happen? I said, no. <laughs> I mean, not in my lifetime. But I'm doing it out of moral duty. It's standing in solidarity with an oppressed people, even more oppressed than us, I felt at the time. So I had to stand in solidarity. But it happened in my lifetime. So um, I think our conceptions of what's impossible after Egypt should be a bit humbled. The impossible is becoming is, is looking much more possible. And when you say that the US is guaranteeing Israel's loans, the US needs somebody to guarantee its loans. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, China is guaranteeing the US loans. So, so the US is not in such a good shape at this point, and it's only liable to go down, not up. So with Israel losing its Arab support, and with Western uh, European countries at least, not the US yet, European countries becoming much more public in their discontent, very polite, very slow discontent uh, against Israel, settlement policy against Israel, uh, aggression and, and uh, lack of initiative, as, as they put it in a British understatement, <laughs> towards peace and so on, um, um, Israel is feeling the pressure. Now, mainstream Israeli politicians, um, um, officials in the Mossad, the Israeli intelligence agency, um, top Israeli academics are saying, we are a pariah. It's not that we're be becoming, we are already a pariah. Just recently, um, a top Israeli diplomat, uh, former ambassador to South Africa, Ilan Baruch, resigned from the foreign ministry. Uh, it was in Haaretz a few days ago. And in his resignation letter, he explained that I cannot any longer uh, represent the policy of the State of Israel. And he said, those who are saying that criticism of Israel's occupation is anti-Semitic, that's so simplistic and so wrong. It's all about our policy. And unless we establish good relations with the Palestinians, this will continue to happen. Uh, so if, if top Israeli diplomats have reached this conclusion, and think tanks and so on, um, they feel that it's happening. Why should we be less optimistic? Thank you. Um, we're kind of beginning to run out of time, um, but there are two together at the back. Viva Palestina. <laughs> uh, um, Mark, it's, uh, it's a great privilege to be at uh, your first book launch. I'm sure it won't be your, your last. Um, I come from Tower Hamlets, and uh, the London Borough of Tower Hamlets Council uh, just uh, four weeks ago voted to end any relationship with Veolia and to damn it for its support for the illegal settlement. <laughs> and those who say, oh, there's so much to do, um, you should have seen just how hard those who support the State of Israel in uh, Tower Hamlets tried to stop that motion going through. And I think that's indicative of just how significant the BDS campaign has been. It's been ab absolutely fantastic. I wanted to raise a, a tactical question with you. I've seen very long lists of companies that we should boycott. Lists which do begin to sort of feel at this stage at any rate somewhat unrealistic. And it seems, certainly people have argued, it's better to focus on particular companies like Veolia, which are particularly criminal in their activity. I wonder what your feeling was on the question of focus. First, I salute you.
for the campaign you've done. We're very proud of that and we're really happy and inspired by that. Um, I agree fully with you. Those long lists are totally intimidating. Mm -hmm. uh, the number of companies complicit in Israel's war machine, occupation and apartheid, is endless. I mean, Israel is totally integrated into the world economy. We cannot do South African tactics now. I'll just give a joke about this South African tactics and I'll come back to the question. Ronnie Castrels, former minister in the South African government, who happens to be Jewish, uh, we were touring together in Canada, in, in Britain, sorry, and on the train, he was telling me, you know, Omar, you should use one of our tactics in spreading leaflets in, you know, central Tel Aviv. I said, yeah, and what's that? He said, you know, we used to go to Johannesburg, clandestinely, and put all these flyers in a barrel, and then hide them with something, and light up some firecrackers, and they would fly all over the place, and people would jump to grab them. I said, Ronnie, we have email. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so we don't borrow. It's not a copy-paste kind of experience. We learn a lot from our comrades in South Africa. We're in, on, in constant dialogue with them. We really are learning a lot from them, but we do our own tactics. In, in the same sense, we defer to our partners. In the UK, BDS is not a centralized movement. It's not a party hierarchy ideology. Uh, it depends a lot on the creativity and initiative at the local level. So we defer to our partners in every part of the world uh, to know best what to do, what to target. Certainly having a list of 100 companies, which, which sounds like, oh, here goes my shampoo, here goes my food, here goes my, my clothing. Here go. It's, uh, you know, then you, you can't live, actually. It feels like boycotting China, where, you know, you, you don't do anything in life. Um, it, it doesn't help us at all. We need to be strategic and we need to focus on campaigns that we can win. We don't do BDS to feel good. We're doing it to attain our rights. So we need victories. We need sustainable, continuous victories. And if a victory is too fast, it's no good, because it's not sustainable. We've had victories that were too fast, too fastly achieved. So we, we had not built a movement to carry on that victory, to build on it, to protect it first, because of course we're under attack and to carry on and build on it. That's what we need to do. So if Veolia is the target in one place, great. That's a huge target, extremely important target, and that does affect Israel. When Veolia, it, Veolia has been trying to sell its share in the Jerusalem light rail for a year. No one would buy, except Israeli companies. Who dares to buy after Veolia had lost close to $10 billion worth of contracts? We're teaching world corporations a lesson in ethical responsibility. Thank you very much. The, the other one at the back. Hi, um, I wanted to ask what you thought were the biggest um, obstacles or the biggest obstacle to um, BDS movement becoming as, going to be as widespread as South African one. Um, and uh, also if, if you could say something about um, sort of state repression of activists in the BDS movement, like in France or within Israel itself? Um, first, I'm glad you mentioned Israel because we have a BDS campaign within Israel. It's called Boycott from Within. It, it has gathered a lot of momentum uh, lately. We have several partners in Israel, including the Coalition of Women for Peace, who run the Who Profits uh, from the Occupation website, an excellent resource for BDS activists all over the world. We all use it. It's, an, it's a database of all the companies, or the great majority of companies, profiting from Israel's uh, occupation. So that's a very good resource. Yes, repression in Israel is on the rise against BDS campaigners, especially Israeli BDS campaigners. They're debating in the Knesset, not debating, discussing, there isn't much debate actually, uh, in the Knesset, passing an anti-BDS, anti-boycott law that would criminalize calling for a boycott even not even calling for boycott as in, you know, doing political activism type of work. Even if you write in, in the talkback section of any newspaper article, if you write your comment, yeah, I think Israel should be boycotted, and then an Israeli company loses revenue or claim to lose revenue to, due to the boycott, they can sue you according to that law. You'll be liable. So it's truly scary. I mean, it's going to a repressive measure that has not been seen before 
inside Israel against Israeli citizens, this is extreme. And this is precisely why the bureaucracy in the foreign ministry in Israel are against it, by the way. Our only ally are the foreign ministry, because they're so scared that if this passes, Israel will lose the last veneer of democracy in the West. It will really reveal its true self. And they don't want that. But repression is on the rise uh, in Israel. Uh, in France as well, Canada, they're trying to criminalize the boycott of Israel, trying to use arguments that are really untenable, but the hypocrisy in Europe, as you know, is, is an art. <laughs> uh, in the US as well, of course. I do not mean to leave out the US. Um, but but um, I think this is the last resort. Israel, its lobbies, and its uh, uh, protectors and supporters in the West have lost the battle for the hearts and minds. They've lost it. It's, it's, it's finished. Polls have shown that it has lost it. That does not mean that it has already translated into everyone is supporting the boycott. Not yet. But the potential is enormous because the publics are not convinced that Israel, Israel's regime is okay. But the last resort is the legal repression. So they're resorting to courts everywhere. Everywhere. This is the new thing to counter BDS. They do not debate us because at the intellectual level, moral level, they've lost. And they will lose. Really, I mean, th there is no way to debate us, actually. I mean, I don't blame them for refusing. What the hell could they say? No, we don't believe in equal rights. That's the only argument they can put forth. No, we don't believe that Palestinians should be treated like humans. They should continue to be treated like something, another species. Uh, so legal repression is the only thing they can do, and that's a very effective weapon. The second obstacle in answering your question, I think, is, is the, um, the occupation of our minds, the inhibitions we have, that this is unbeatable, this is um, extremely difficult to do, so we will not do it. I think once we overcome this internal inhibition, this in, the self-censorship is extremely important. As Edward Said once said, many intellectuals and academics, first, just to give one example, know what's right and refuse to say the right thing. They're so scared of the repercussion. They're so scared of being attacked by the lobby as anti-Semites, as whatever. They could be Jewish, but they're still attacked as anti-Semites, as some of our Jewish friends in the boycott campaign know very well. Um, so that self-censorship is, I think, the biggest obstacle. We have to overcome that by awareness raising and by campaigning. It's not enough to sit on an armchair and read about BDS. I mean, the book would be nice to read, but you need to do some action, and you learn much more in action. Thank you. Um, we're getting very much to the end now, but I'll just take the lady in the, uh, the lady here. Yeah, there are people behind you as well. Did you not want to say something, madam? No. Okay, um, Mr. Yibla. I was delighted to hear about the only in Tower Hamlets because I work in Tower Hamlets. Hey, hey. Well, speak up. I'm, I was delighted to hear about Veolia in Tower Hamlets because when I'm working in Tower Hamlets, I always get upset to see Veolia knowing it's complicit with the crimes of the Israeli regime. And now I've also found that it's complicit with other regimes like Saudi and so on. Um, but my question is regarding the, um, uh, you were mentioning legal aspects. And uh, one of the things that seems to be happening in the UK is that they are trying to assist um, uh, in, uh, and, and bend to the, to the Israeli lobbying, particularly when uh, Tippi Livni was, uh, was kept out of the country by um, um, uh, action stopping her coming as a war criminal. What's, the, <clears throat> what's your view on, on the um, universal jurisdiction uh, legislation that looks like it's coming up in the UK? We had a part, we had a, mem uh, a meeting uh, at the British Parliament today with uh, ranking members of the Liberal Democratic Party, and uh, it seems like this will pass. Cancelling or changing universal jurisdiction seems set to pass, unfortunately. So Israel will have another win in the British Parliament. No surprise there. The surprise is that it took so long to achieve that victory, uh, and this is a problem for I think British citizens. The, the government is actually pushing for a resolution that says we want to increase, to extend, to expand Israel's impunity. 
well, it commits war crimes. So it's okay for Israeli war criminals to visit Britain with total impunity, without fear of being arrested and tried for war crimes. And this is not just about Israeli war criminals, it's about all kinds of war criminals that the British government likes. I mean, when they don't like a war criminal, like in Zimbabwe, for example, they would arrest him, but other war criminals that they like, they can pass by London easily without any accountability. So I think this is something not just about Palestine, it is certainly a win for Israel, but it should be rejected by every liberal person in this country. <coughs> not just progressives, every liberal person who has any respect for the rule of law should reject this. Universal jurisdiction was an extremely important achievement for humankind. I mean, a, a big advance uh, for, in the international legal system. We should not give it up. This would just increase the impunity of war criminals all over. Um, now we're coming, I'm going to the front, don't worry. Um, so I'll take you as the last question. Um, how, how do you, um, you're living in Israel, you're doing a PhD, you're studying at an Israeli university. How does that equate with your boycott campaign? Isn't that uh, hypocritical to live in Israel and consume everything Israeli, but then call for a boycott of Israel? And secondly, if, um, God forbid, you uh, ever needed a life-saving medicine or member of your family that was developed in Israel, um, would you accept that medicine or would you reject that to life-saving medicine? Okay. Uh, I think Mandela went to an apartheid university. Uh, when you're living under apartheid, you have no choice. You pay taxes to the apartheid regime, you accept services from the apartheid regime. How else can you survive? Why do you do that? You go to the hospitals, you go to universities, you go to the post office, you go to government offices in the apartheid regime. You're a, a, a subject of that colonial system. There's no other way. Gandhi said it at the British University as well. Uh, the point is, when you're under occupation or under apartheid, you have no moral choice. There's no choice. We ask people outside to boycott because they have a moral choice. Responsibility comes with choice. Germans under Nazi rule who couldn't open their mouths were cowards, but we can perhaps forgive them for not opening their mouth when you think that they would be shot by the Nazi genocidal regime if they opened their mouth. Israelis that stay silent are far more cowardly because they do have a choice and they won't get shot if they stand up against the occupation. Uh, so uh, we measure this with how much choice you have. When you have no choice, what, what do you do? So there's absolutely no double standard for people under oppression to call on people who are not under oppression, standing in solidarity with them, to oppose and boycott completely the oppressive regime. What we cannot do, you can do in the UK. Um, if the second part of your question, um, we, of course, we do not boycott Israeli medicines in Israel. What else can you buy? We don't, we're, we're not irrational. I don't know your view of the Arabs, but you know, <laughs> we're not suicidal. I think we'll end there. Uh, excuse me, excuse me. If you want to talk to Omar afterwards, you can. Why are you here? I'm Palestinian. You grown up in Egypt. I want to say a very big thank you to Omar for this very good expose he's given of the whole question and for his generosity in spending the time and answering everybody's questions so interestingly. Um, anybody who wants him to sign their book <coughs> Um, he's willing to do so. And thank you all very much indeed for coming. And thank you to the bookshop for very short notice for organising this. Um, but anyway, I think that, that, that is um, who Omar is aiming the book at. And I think that is what this the evening together is about. So I'm just going to give you a very little tiny bit of background before Omar speaks. Um, and I haven't discussed this with him, so um, he may or may not completely agree with the way I'm going to do it. Um, but I, I date this book and the whole campaign 
um, back to 2004, when the ICJ made its ruling that the wall was illegal. Because it was just a year later that you had 171 Palestinian civil society groups that issued their call for BDS. Um, and they, I think it's worth just reminding us what were the three bits of their plank. The first was to end the occupation and dismantle the wall. The second was the rights of Arab Palestinian citizens of Israel to complete equality. And the third was respecting the rights of refugees to return under UN Resolution 194. And I think that kind of bottom line emphasis on rights is where this whole thing has managed to get the immense echo and traction it's got around the world. Um, it was only three years later, in 2008, that what had been the BDS campaign kind of formalized itself into the BNC, which is a coalition. And that coalition had, again, three strands to it. One was refugees, the second was people from the West Bank and Gaza, and the third was Palestinians living inside Israel. And I think that in such a short time, that's five years from when, um, when the, the first BDS call came, um, there's been a complete sea change in attitudes to Israel around the world. And I think this campaign is a significant factor within that sea change. And I would describe that sea change as an ending of what was a kind of lazy, automatic feeling that Israel was a democratic state in the middle of the Middle East and it was seeking peace. And that, I think, has been completely ripped up in this five years. And I think the campaign by Palestinians, both from inside and Palestinians in the diaspora, has been such a huge factor in that. Now, I just want to read very briefly three things to you um, which, are, which are in the book, um, but I think need to be... Victoria Britain and I'm extremely honoured to have been asked by Omar to um, briefly introduce his little talk about his wonderful book, um, which you can see there and which you'll be able to buy afterwards um, if you want. Um, now, his book is obviously BDS, that's what it's about, but I want to stress one word in what's in the title. I like the way that he's called it the global struggle for Palestinian rights. And the question of rights, I think it kind of often gets forgotten when you're talking about Palestinians. Um, and this, the book has been, um, has got endorsements from all sorts of very eminent and wonderful people, such as um, Desmond Tutu um, and our own dear Ken Loach. And it's the particular words that Ken has used that I want to emphasize tonight. What he said was a very simple thing, which is, when powerful governments will not act, ordinary people must take the lead. And I think that's who we are. Um, sorry if there's anybody here who is more eminent than that. <laughs> um, acquiescence, and some would say encouragement of the international community. Very strong stuff from a UN official and absolutely and completely accurate, as any of you who've been in Gaza will know. And the final words I want to, to, to read, which lay on from, come on from that, are from John Dugard, who, as you all know, is a South African um, international law expert and was formerly the UN Special Rapporteur for Human Rights. 
and in 2007 he wrote this. The West cannot expect the rest of the world to take issues it regards as important seriously if it persists in its present attitude to the Israeli occupation. For the rest of the world, the issue of Palestine has become the litmus test for human rights. If the West fails to show concern for human rights in the OPT, the rest of the world will conclude that human rights are a tool employed by the West against regimes it dislikes and not an objective and universal instrument for the measurement of the treatment of people throughout the world. And I think that responding to that, the BDS campaign has brought us to, to watch a new stage of what you might call decades of evolving Palestinian resistance, which has taken very much kind of um, underlined. The first is um, apropos of Gaza after the terrible events of December and January 2008-2009. Um, I want to take you back to the 1948 UN Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide, Article 2. The term is again defined in three ways. Any of the following acts committed with intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethnical, racial or religious group. As such, one, killing members of the group. Two, causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group. And three, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part. And I'm just going to read a line from the former uh, Commissioner General of UNRWA, Karen Abu Zaid, apropos of Gaza. She used these words, which I think fit into that 1948 um, definition. Gaza is on the threshold of becoming the first territory to be intentionally reduced to a state of abject destitution, with the knowledge 